Hey everyone, this is Doug Carston, and you're listening to the We WFM podcast, which aspires to be the go-to source for all things workforce management. Today, I'm speaking with Emery Ong, whose current role is Partnership and Expansion Manager at Vivid Money, based out of Berlin, Germany. To me, what makes Emery a super interesting person to speak to is his highly varied range of roles that he's occupied career to date, including project management, operational readiness, customer service management, and that's on top of the seven years of workforce management experience that he gained early on in his career. This gives him a unique point of view from both inside and outside of the workforce management circle. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed interviewing Emily. Super excited to have Emery Ong here to join me here today. Uh, Emery has had a really varied career to date, spanning across two continents, including seven years in workforce management early on in his career, which is interesting given his uh, career direction since. Emery, thank you so much for taking time today. I know you're super busy. You work in probably one of the fastest paced industries. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Um, we're going to get onto obviously workforce management topics later. That's what this podcast is about. Um, but we we really want to get to know the individuals first. Um, so there's uh, some get to know questions if that's okay with you. Um, starting with what, what where where you're currently based in the world and who do you work for and what were you doing prior to that? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm currently based out of Berlin, Germany. Um, but uh, most of my career uh, actually was spent in Canada, uh, where I worked in uh, banking and financial services, uh, held a number of different positions there, uh, mainly in operations and technology, workforce management being one of them, as you mentioned. Um, I'm now currently working uh, for a, a Berlin-based uh, fintech startup called Vivid, or Vivid Money, as it's sometimes known. Um, so we're, you know, we're quite new in the market. We've only been around for just a little over a year and a half and uh, but we're making some great progress so far in terms of bringing um, you know more comprehensive financial services and banking services investing uh, whatnot in a, in a sort of an integrated experience to our customers throughout Europe. Immediately prior to this I, I also spent some time working at uh, N26 uh, which, which is also quite uh, well known in, uh, in the neo banking space uh, for, for about a year and a half as well in uh, operations. And then prior to that, I also spent a bit of time uh, working at booking.com in the uh, digital uh, travel and hospitality space. Yeah, the the, the neo-banking world is is really exciting. It's definitely disrupting the banking industry. Obviously, you know from from me that I have a a bit of uh, history there as well. Walk me through uh, like what's a regular day for you? What sort of things do you you get involved in day to day? Yeah, so my my role uh, entails helping to lead our strategic initiatives related to market expansion, right? So really kind of bringing to market our brand in countries where we don't already operate. Um, So my day basically entails, you know, you know, we we usually have a a, a sync, a quick sync call with our team in the morning, about 15 minutes, just to kind of align on, you know, priorities, uh, sort of tasks for the day. Uh, and then I just go at it, um, really just uh, leading projects, um, working across functional teams. Um, I, I also do take on a bit of a, a, a PR uh, role as well <laughs> in my current position. So I, I work very closely with some of our uh, various different PR agencies, um, okay. providing kind of a localization in terms of the overall experience and, and uh, outreach to different uh, media partners that we have as well. Okay, that's well. I mean, I said varied career. I think uh, your role it, itself right now is pretty varied, so that, that's pretty cool. I didn't know about the PR side of things as well. That must that must be an interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the nature of a startup, right? You you, you have to wear many hats, and uh, you have you've got to be adaptable. But uh, I, I think that comes with its own benefits as well. Yeah, that's that's very true. It, one of the things that we've been asking people as we've been interviewing them is is uh, is things like. If you had known something before the start of your career or something that you could go back and say, I wish I could tell my younger self um, before I started a career, what would that be? Probably would have told myself to invest in some Bitcoin. Um, 
<laughs> but yeah. I suppose that's Me in too. hindsight now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, in all seriousness, I, I think in retrospect, you know, um, for me, uh, I, I spent a, a fair bit of time working for one organization mm. in one industry. And I, I think sometimes you can kind of fall into this sort of trap of complacency. So my advice would just be, don't be complacent, you know, uh, constantly challenge yourself, push mm. yourself, uh, put yourself in, in out of your comfort zone and expose mm. yourself to different areas because you, you don't know. Um, you might come across something that really um, inspires you and, mm. and, and really wants, you know, makes you get up for work every morning um, you know, wanting to, to tackle on uh, that challenge. So just don't settle. Uh, mm. I think that's really the, the, the key thing. Yeah, I have a similar type um, thought process that I kind of, I can't almost imagine myself on my deathbed and go, okay, what it, what regrets would I have? Um, so it's always that that moment where you go, oh, okay, should I do this? Should I not? Uh, I totally get that. I think that's a really great, great mentality. Um, Another question that, that that we were asking is is I I found this personally really super interesting hearing different thoughts. Um, but who are the three people that would you say that have been the most influential for you? Well, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, you come across so many different people throughout your life, and, and each kind of leaves a different influence. Whether it's mm. in terms of your career and your personal life. I mean, I, I, if I had to think about this and just in those two aspects, I would say, you know, I've had a, a, a number of managers that I've worked for in the past who I felt were um, not only just managers, but really like mentors, you know, mm. they, they were looking out for my best interests, not on a day to day, not just on a day to day, but they were looking at my best interests in terms of my own career development. Um, and so I've had a, a few individuals who who've really helped me in this respect. Um, you know, they, they were the main reasons why, um, you know, I decided to, to dabble in different areas of our business and, you know, and they, they weren't afraid, you know, to give hard truths. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, my, my family obviously is a big influence. Um, you know, I look at my parents, you know, they, they were immigrants uh, when they moved to Canada, okay. um, you know, so they had to go through their own challenges and mm. in integrating um, and that gave me an appreciation for what they went through when I decided to relocate to Germany, you know, mm. and, and having to acclimatize myself to a new culture, language, what have you. So I, I think that that definitely was a big influence for me as well. And the third, I didn't necessarily say person, but persons, I would say, are that, you know, the many individuals that I've had to lead throughout my career in mm. teams that I've had to manage, you know. I think every time you have that opportunity dealing with individuals, regardless of their background, you know, it sort of teaches you something about yourself as well. And oftentimes I feel like when I'm at home, you know, I'm, I, I have my own family to also lead. And my wife is also giving me some hard truths as well. So anytime you, you kind of are responsible for other people in a way, I think that lends itself to a lot of really important insights in your life. I, I, you may have touched on this earlier. What brought you to Berlin? Was it a job, or was it was you studying here? I to... it, it was it was mainly um, yeah career related. You know, I, I I wanted to put myself in a situation where you know I was exposed to a, a new market, working okay. culture, what have you. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, I think it's super interesting because obviously I know I know that Canada has a very open, or at least today has a very open cultural, or tries to be very open culturally. Have you found any sort of differences um for you know coming to to germany and in, in terms of say the professional working or kind of way of living yeah i mean to some extent you know the obviously the language is different yeah, um sure al although having said that you know when you're working in sort of this fintech ecosystem that i find myself in you, you're working with a lot of different internationals mm. you know from from various parts of the world so that does help in some ways to kind of ease that transition. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say it, it, it was um, a huge jump, but it did come with its own challenges. That, yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Uh, and then talking about fintech, I know we touched upon this earlier around it definitely disrupting the banking industry. Um, what, what excites you about the fintech? I mean, it's just now the, the second time, the second company that you've been in with fintech. Um, yeah, what, what gets you up in the at the side of the day? Well, I mean, it's just like you were saying, it's it's such a kind of fast evolving space right now. You know, the thing is like, 
fintech in of itself, I don't think is anything new. Like mm. innovation in financial technology has been around with us for decades. I think the term fintech is, is relatively new, but when you kind of look beyond that, um, I think there's a lot of really cool stuff happening right now. I mean, I, you look at all of the advancements in cryptocurrency and blockchain, um, you know, in mobile, um, the mobile banking investing experience. I think this has had a, such a huge um, paradigm shift in terms of what we're expecting now. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of really cool stuff happening in the years to come, especially when, when I look at, you know, for example, in uh, if you look in the DeFi space, how that's empowering people, mm. you know, democratizing um, consumers when it comes to financial management, when it comes to banking. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see how this all plays out in the future, especially when it comes to regulation and balancing that against mm. consumer needs. Yeah, that, that, that's true. I think um, I think Baffin, who, by the way, if people don't know, that's the, the German regulator for the banking industry. I think they're still figuring out what, how to regulate an, a near bank. And I know that they, they've almost created a whole new department just for neobanks. So uh, definitely, definitely on the regulation side, it's, it's an interesting, interesting landscape. Um, do, do you get in, in your day to day, do you get much involved with sort of AI and automation um, within uh, Vivid? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a, a multitude of applications when it comes to AI. Um, I don't work with AI myself directly, at least. Um, mm. I think my involvement is more at arm's length in terms of interacting with various product owners that do uh, dabble with AI. From what I understand, at least, um, it, there's certainly an application for it in operations. Um, you know, we have a chatbot at Vivid, and that chatbot is built some form of machine learning in the background. Mm. Uh, so it is learning, it is adapting to, uh, based on the inputs that it receives from our customers. So I, I definitely see that, you know, as being something that's key. We also have a lot of microservices um, that we we want to try to automate as well in the background to just provide a much more efficient um, experience um, processes, you know, for our for our customers in the end. But uh, absolutely, I mean, I think there's there's a huge opportunity uh, when it comes to AI in terms of how it can be applied in the space. And I know that because I have this conversation um, with many people that I speak to, but do you think there's still a space in it for a career in the contact industry over the, say, say the next decade or two um, because of AI and automation? Do you think this, I mean, this this fear isn't there that it's going to replace all our jobs, for example? Yeah, well, look, I, I think this type of, of conception about, a, um, about innovation and technology has been around for a long time, right? I mean, you look back at industrial revolution, introduction <laughs> of machinery and so on. Very it did true. put a lot of people out of work. At the same time, it also created a lot of new opportunities, right? So I don't really see AI being that much different in this regard. Surely, yes, you will see uh, likely a lot of tasks that are made redundant, let's say, or automized, thereby removing the human element. Um, but at the same time, I think there will always be a need to have some form of human interaction. You know, if, if you just talk about the, like, you know, in the customer service or customer care context, you know, there will always be edge cases. There will always be a need for that human element. And quite fairly, I think that it will bring about more benefits because if you think about it in the end, you know, you're eliminating sort of this more maybe kind of menial work mm. uh, from individuals. And what you're left with uh, will hopefully be more meaningful to the individual in the end. You know, they'll be they'll be taking on uh, tasks that are are just much more engaging, at least you know, uh, in that respect. So I, I I see more benefits definitely than than negatives. It's interesting because I I, I kind of see something similar in workforce management in in that um, it's it's replacing the the repetitive tasks, um, the the ones that kind of you in many cases people moan about every day actually in their job but it's not what it can't do um or not at least not yet is is that is that empathetic connection which i think is for me plays out really strongly in the contact industry i think it plays out in every industry or every job and and i will say that like you know to my kids that probably the, the number one skill that they need to have is is empathy because going forward everything else may be automated but the the emotional attachment to between a conversation, human to human, is something I I think is well I know I'm never going to say never, but it's going to be difficult to replace for sure. 
moving on then to kind of workforce management, obviously that's what, what this podcast is about. I, I struggle to, so like if my parents ask me, what do I do for a living? I always struggle with this question or what do you do? And so in your own words, what, how would you phrase workforce management? What does it mean to you? Managing work. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the yeah. most simplest terms, I suppose. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, it's funny you, that you asked this question because this, this is obviously something I myself have too struggled with. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think outside of workforce management circles, if not outside of, you know, um, operations or, or customer sort of facing operations, I think workforce management is generally not widely understood. Um, mm. It tends to be a, let's say, niche discipline, if you will, at least in, in that context. Um, but I, for me, it's just workforce management is simply just looking for efficiencies, looking for efficiencies in your human labor, right? H how do you manage your workforce in a way that gives you the, the most optimal output in terms of the work that you're asking these people to do? And that to me is, is quite simply the, the objective behind workforce management. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I know that you haven't particularly got involved in, in workforce management since coming to Berlin, although you've obviously been in, in and around it. Um, have you noticed any differences between, say, workforce management deployed in Canada versus versus what you've witnessed in, in, in Germany? And um, there seems to be, at least from, from my perspective, uh, a difference between in, in terms of exposure. So there's a lot of companies that kind of see it in it in its as a maybe someone's just doing the scheduling um but i know in canada for example or in north america it's very widespread practically every corporation has um a workforce management unit and often they're strategic why do you think there's a difference and or have you witnessed that difference and and if so um why do you think there is a there is a difference in exposure um, so I wouldn't necessarily say there's a huge difference. I mean, I could probably say that there are pro more similarities than there are differences. Mm. Um, like for example, you know, the, the concepts are, the, are, are very similar how, terminology, the tools, um, you know, and, and many organizations are, are multinational as you know. So, you know, they, they may even mm. have a, a centralized workforce team, you know, that operates across multiple markets. Uh, so, um, but I would say, though, that um, workforce management, at least just based on my own experience, anecdotally speaking here, um, tends to be something that's much more part and parcel with operations. You know, like, like it's almost understood that, OK, once you reach a certain scale within your business, there, there is a need mm. to have this. Um, and okay. Perhaps in Europe, it's maybe not as popular in that sense. But I, I think the, the question is also... It needs to be looked at with a bit of nuance, right? Because, you know, if you're, if you're talking about, um, you know, workforce management in the context of a startup, mm. I would hazard a guess that it doesn't hold the same value irrespective of whether you're talking about North America or in Europe. Yeah. I think you'll, you'll always have a sort of a, a, a learning uh, stage that the mm. organization will need to make to fully see the value that workforce management brings. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting pers perspective. And actually, thinking about it i mean germany has well uh it, it was well, famous for its small to medium sized businesses so I, I guess from a german perspective that plays out really well actually um maybe it is that get that many more bigger corporations in north america that that kind of promote workforce management and looking for those efficiencies uh, and yeah I, actually it, just just to maybe add quickly mm, to this please, um, yeah. it, so um i have noticed as well that you know, at least in, in terms of some of the the, the vendors or, or the service uh, professional services providers that I've worked with in the workforce space, you know, there there are quite a lot a number of large organizations that are based out of the United States, and, and, and these are you know huge companies that have a lot of resources to really mm. kind of promote the whole concept behind workforce management. And if I look, for example, you know, you have the uh, CCW conference that takes place here mm. in Berlin. You'll you'll get some level of, of workforce representation, but it's not like you have it in, in, in the US where you'll you'll find like conferences that are mm. literally just dedicated to this one topic that bring you know like-minded professionals together in, in into a single space. So I think there is a, a difference, at least in that respect. 
do you, do you think that's because there isn't somebody representing in Europe or is it because it's just not it's just not needed at this point well, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, I mean, we're, we're in the midst of a pandemic. I think it's obviously <laughs> a little difficult to organize such large forums right now. Mm. But no, I, I think it's just, I think it's just a virtue of the scale and size of the organizations. Mm. I mean, I, I recall, you know, when I was uh, working in Canada, you know, our uh, we had operations in the United States as well, and uh, Nice had had a really big presence down there. Um, you know, and they would literally just like fly their clients down to their headquarters you know, put everyone up in a hotel, big convention center, you know, huge, huge events like this. And I mean, these things were just crazy. Um, and it's really cool. Like, you know, you're in that kind of environment and you're connecting with people that are outside of your industry, but working in a workforce management capacity. And I think that's something that can definitely be applied here in Europe. It's not to say that it isn't, but I think that there is a certain kind of aura you know when it comes to having these sort of events especially when they're so mm. focused on a particular discipline yeah that's 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 very true yeah that's very true but we, we're drawing to the end of the the podcast um but I, the, the question i'm kind of ending all of my podcasts with is with is uh what would you be your top three strategies tips for workforce management i know it's been a, a while but what, what did you oh, you must have learned something in that in those seven years yeah well um <laughs> You're really making me think about this one. Um, so, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is um, getting the buy-in around workforce management. I, I, I think that oftentimes, you know, when pe when business owners look at operations, they they see customer service or customer care as mainly as a cost center, right? Mm. And uh, workforce management, in some respects, is kind of a a necessary evil, let's say. But maybe what's not as appreciated sometimes is the added value that can also bring. And what I mean by that is, you know, you, you're dealing with um, human resources, but it, you know, you find efficiencies and those efficiencies can then be translated into something else. You can have those same people performing other tasks in the organization where you're under-resourced, you know? Um, so there's so many ways that, you know, you can kind of apply workforce management and I think it's just about kind of presenting that to those that have that influence, that decision-making responsibility to understand the true value of it. Um, the second thing I would probably say is it's never too early to start. You know, um, workforce management does not require millions of euros or dollars of cost outlay. You know, it could start with a simple Excel spreadsheet, albeit that has limits in terms mm -hmm. of scalability. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, start early, start early and start building up that competency and really start to kind of, you know, um, scale with the company as it moves along. It's a lot easier to do it when you start early than when you're trying to adopt a, a workforce management centric framework when, when the company is already going through a, a rapid scaling process. And I would say probably the last thing maybe is just kind of uh, in terms of the, the, the acumen I've noticed traditionally that a lot of workforce management professionals tend to come out of um, an operations background. Maybe they've worked in a front, front line, a position before in a contact center environment, things like that. Um, but it doesn't always have to be, <laughs> you know, uh, workforce management does not necessarily mean you have to work in a, a service or, or customer facing uh, type capacity. You know, there are, there are different types of people that can bring value to a workforce um, a team if, if you know the kind of attributes to look for. So, you know, don't hesitate to kind of broaden your scope when it comes to looking for talent uh, within workforce management. So those would be my my three. I think they're really great tips. And um, yeah, the, on that last one, I think not only in terms of the, the people that can come into workforce management, but I think the workforce management can be arguably deployed in many other um, types of industries and verticals outside of the even the customer service arena. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, think, I think it's uh, an interesting slant for sure. But, but Emery, I know you're short for time for today and I but I and I really do appreciate you taking it, especially with the up and coming um, family events that are on, on the play. I won't talk about that too much for you today, but thank you very much. Your insights have been brilliant and, uh, and I really appreciate it. All the best. Yeah, my pleasure, Doug. Happy to uh, happy to have a chat with you. Today. Thanks, Emery. Thank you for listening to VWFM. 
This podcast is made and produced by André Leitão, Bilga Hentelun, Doug Carsten, Gonçalo Gomes, and Kim Paz. If you like this show, don't forget to share it with your friends and colleagues. Visit our website, wfm.com, to find more exclusive interviews and WFM content. See you next time. All rights reserved. <laughs>